think now initially his first trip, why did he initially go to Jerusalem? I'll give you a hint. At about age 13 or 14, he went to study at the feet of Gamaliel, right? Acts 22.3. Okay. To study the Torah at the university there. We discussed this, you and I did, at that time in some detail. If the parents could afford it, if their son was academically inclined, then, of course, their epitome of learning and education at that time was to go to study at, at the university in Jerusalem. And I put other events. Now, what I'm trying to get across, I didn't, do, I didn't word the sentence or the question very good, but the other events I'm talking about, I gave you a hint when I gave you Acts chapter 7, verse 58. His second journey, he goes back about age 25 or 26, and we see his name for the first time, don't we, in Acts 7, 58. And that was at what event? The stoning of Stephen. He's holding the goats, the coach. Now, we see three things here that are very significant. We see his name mentioned. We know he's going back to Jerusalem. We know he's holding coats at the stoning of Stephen. And just as important, we know from Acts 8 and verse 1 that he was perfectly happy, content, and satisfied with the stoning of this man called Stephen. Tells us a lot about this young man. Number five. What was Saul's mission as he set out on his journey? I should, probably should have said his first journey, but anyway, on his journey to Damascus. I give you a hint, Acts 9-2. Why did he go initially from Jerusalem to Damascus? Who was, he, who was he chasing? Christians, right? That's right. Most all the Christians had been chased out of Jerusalem for, because of the persecution. And he went to the high priest, Acts 9, 1 and 2, and got papers. I like to consider those a, a blanket arrest warrant. But anyway, he goes on that trip to catch, if you will, Christians and tie them up and bring them back for perse further persecution in Jerusalem. Now, what number 6A, what physical affliction did Saul suffer on the trip to Damascus, blinded, all right. Now, 6B, was he closer to Jerusalem or Damascus when Jesus appeared unto him? The text says nigh unto, does it not? The text says nigh unto, uh, okay, that's all right, thank you. Nigh unto what? Damascus. Now, it's about a 140-mile trip, so I think sometimes people get a little carried away, and they make it look like it's been 10 steps to Damascus. Well, a 140-mile trip being nigh could be 5 or 10 miles, couldn't it? He'd still be nigh to Damascus. But anyway, he was led the last stretch, blinded, into Damascus. All right. 7A, was Saul saved on the road to Damascus? The answer is no. Thank you. If not, where? In Damascus. He was told to go to the straight, the street called Straight, upper floor. He told what to do. Three days and three nights without food or water. Who baptized Saul? The man's name was Ananias. Who was he? The Bible tells us he was a devout man of the law. Okay. Number eight. To what entities was Saul directed to go preach? Three entities. Who was he, who was he told to go preach to? Acts 9.15. Gentiles, kings, and Jews, right? Okay. Now, Further study helps us understand the order. That's not the order. We'll talk more about that later. All right, now, 
What did Saul immediately, this is not, I didn't mean this is a trick question, but this makes, you, this makes you study your Bible closely. What did Paul do immediately after his conversion? Huh? The very first thing he did. I didn't hear you, Charlie. He ate. Look at the text. He took meat. You know, it was three days and three nights without food or water, right? What would you do? What would be the first thing you'd do? You know, we, the, the Lord knows us. He made us. He knows we can go about three days without water. We can go about three minutes without oxygen. We can go about three minutes without water. We can go about three weeks without food. Well, he'd been three days without eating or drinking, so the first thing he did was eat and drink some water, I'm sure, along with that. All right. Now, uh, and then, of course, he preached. Now, I, I could have done a better job on the, the, ten and, the question 10A and, and 9B, so kind of keep that in mind. I'm jumping ahead just a little bit with 9B. How was his preaching received? I'm talking about in Damascus. How was his preaching received? With contempt. That's the answer. His, his preaching was received with contempt. Now, 10A, my question's a little bit out of order, but we're, here we go, 10A. Where did Saul first go? Now, listen now closely. Where did he first go from Damascus? Now, just stop and think about this just a second. He's been baptized by Ananias. He was three days and three nights without food. He took meat and then he tells us in Galatians 1.17, he went to Arabia for three years. Then he comes back to Damascus, which would be his second trip back to Damascus. Now, what did he probably do on that journey? What in the world could he have done for three years in the desert of Arabia? Let's stop and think a minute. What's this man been doing for the last several years. He's been persecuting Christians. He's been trying to, he's making them blaspheme. He's orphaning their children by dragging the men and women out of the house. He's doing all kinds, all manner of evil. His paradigm, his mental state is what? Hate, hate, hate for years. He's had nothing but hate in his heart and his mind. Now he's a Christian. But what's he got to do with his mind? He's got to get that straightened out. He got, you talk about the word debriefing, like maybe some of y'all have to debrief your children depending on what they've been taught. Yeah, can you imagine the praying? Can you imagine the thought process that he went through for three years to try to clear his mind? You know, we talk about clearing our mind. A guy asked me the other day, how do you go about clearing your mind? I said, well, you can't beat physical exercise. There's different things you can do to clear your mind, relieve the stress. All of you folks that are still in the workforce, you know what I'm talking about. Stress relief is required. <laughs> you got to have something to do to, to get that stress off. To get, he had a lot of stress to get rid of. And I'm just suggesting that he went to Arabia. He was there for three years, and he probably did some preaching, but he did a lot of this, clearing, clearing that garbage out. And that's exactly what he did, I believe. He came back. Now, look at number 11. What is significant of Acts, of Acts 26? You want to look up that verse, 26, 16? Bobby, how about reading that for us? Read Acts 26, 16. Everybody please turn there. Acts 26, 16. All right, go ahead, Bob. Okay, thank you. Very important verse. All these verses are important because they're from God, but look at the last part of 16. And of these things in which I will appear 
unto what? Unto thee. Who was this man, Saul of Tarsus? He's a new apostle, and I don't say this with any disrespect, but he was a newbie, wasn't he? Born out of due season. New guy on the block. All this is new to him. The Lord knows not to dump all this on him at one time. He couldn't take it. So what did he do to him? I'm going to be there for you. I will appear unto you. In other words, when you need me, I will be there. Just like when he told Joshua in chapter 1 and verse 5. He said, I won't, I won't leave you and I won't forsake you. He tells us the same thing in Hebrews 13, 5. I won't forsake you. So he's just telling him, I'm going to lead you along the way. I'll be there for you when you need me. And can you imagine how important that was to a new apostle like this man, particularly when you consider his background. He needed help from time to time like we all do. Verse 12. Excuse me, question 12. At the conclusion of what we call journeys of Saul in his early life, where did Saul, this may sound like a rhetorical question, but it's more of a thought thing. He says, where did Saul preach that the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch? Well, you're going to say what? Rightly so, you're going to say Antioch. My point is, <clears throat> let us be sure we don't confuse, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we got two Antiochs. I want to be sure we don't get the Antiochs mixed up. There are numerous Antiochs in the, old, in the ancient world, and I, I've done a study on that, and of course there's a reason for it. But we're just looking for two today. Are uh, we starting here at this just journey, Antioch of Syria, and we're going to end up at Antioch of Pisidia. So we just want to remember when we read Acts 11, 26, that we recognize that it's Antioch of Syria. It is not the Antioch of Pisidia. Two, two important things that are different. Anybody got a question about this? I had to go through it kind of quickly, but I considered a review, and I hope it's been of help to you because I think we have to kind of learn and we have to... Um, Review it again, and maybe after a while we might retain some of this. Anybody got a question on the early travels before we get into our memory verses for today? Okay. Let's look at our memory verses. Um, we're working on this six through next, through next week, and then we're going to go through some more. <clears throat> I'm picking three at a time. I tried to pick easy ones for this two-quarter study. What I mean by that, most of them are one-line one line verses, and I think most of you have these memorized already, but I'm asking you to do one of two things. I'm asking you either to recite it with me, it's perfectly fine for you to read it. You're still going to get a good grade, so just be sure to, but what I, want, what I want you to do is I want you to participate, okay? Say something. All right, here we go. Get ready. Romans 10, 17, and I did this for the teacher and the student, so I'll be sure I got it right, <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right, here we go. So then, ready? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. All right, thank you very much. Now, John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. All right. How about, you know, we talked about this before. Uh, the gospel does a lot of things for you, but arguably the most important thing it does for you and me is to make us free from the bondage of sin. Here we go. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Look at that word shall showing up two times in that verse. All right. We know study is equivalent to one of those dirty, full letter words called work. And it does take work, doesn't it? All right. Let's continue to work this morning. 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right. People say they love God. People all over, you'll ask people all over, oh, yeah, I love God, I love God. Do you really? Well, what's God say? John 14, 15, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. All right, very good. And most of you know, you switch those two numbers right there, 15 and 14, you actually get that in a different wording. If you want to be my friends, he says basically, do whatsoever I command you, right? Okay. Now, here we are. Matthew 6.33, over there at Lake Drive years ago, Al Furline was a two-term preacher there, and people you know, would, from time to time would come in and want to be married. 
And Al told me, he said, well, he, he talked to them a little while, tried to see if they were suitable, if they were, really, if they were really mature enough to get married. But then he used this verse to give them as their guide, Matthew 6, 33. Ready? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And the things being referred to here, if you look at the text, it's the necessities of life, right? It's not the wants. It's the needs. It's a big difference. People sometimes look at that the wrong way. All right, you've been very good on participating with that, <clears throat> and I appreciate it. Now, we'll have these, these six for a little dwelling next Sunday, and then we'll, when my time comes up again, we'll tackle another three. Hopefully, we'll have 12 of them memorized by the end of this study. Now, we're going to go continue with our study on the first missionary journey. Most of you remember from last week, we left Antioch and came across on the ship to Salamis. We spent a lot of time on the island of Cyprus. We had a conversion. Uh, maybe some here, we don't know, but we're not recorded, but he, he was in a couple of synagogues, at least two. And then we go down to Paphos and Sergius Paulus, the governor of the Ro Roman governor of that jurisdiction, uh, was baptized. And now we're getting ready to leave. We learned some interesting things, and one of the things we learned, of course, was that John Mark leaves the three of them. Leaves them by just, just he, he reduces their forces by 33 and a third percent. That's a big hit. It's a big hit. Let me talk about geography just a minute. It says, when we look, look, at our, look at your text, please, in Acts 13, I hope you all are there because we need to do follow this in our Bibles. M many, many, many interesting things are going on here. And, of course, one of the pivotal verses, Johnny Ramsey likes to use that term pivotal, and I think it's great to talk about verse 13 of chapter 13 as a pivotal verse. Now, when Paul and his company... Meaning, of course, he's gravitated to the head of the evangelistic team. Prior to this, it was always Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul. Now it's Paul when his name, his, his name is changed. Now, it says they loosed from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem was his home. We learned that when we studied 1225. Yeah, you know, remember the uh, Barnabas and Saul were sent, the Apostle Saul were sent to Judea for drought relief. There is when they got hooked up, so to speak, with Mark. He came back with them to Antioch and, of course, leaves on their first missionary journey. But he goes home. He goes home. Now, we'll talk just a bit about, about that in a minute. But first of all, we're going to make a 140-mile nautical mile trip from Paphos to Perga. The verse, the verse says that, and, and it's kind of interesting to me. Um, these, as I mentioned, doctors, Dr. Luke, he doesn't, he doesn't waste any words. He said, but they departed from Perga, and they came to Antioch of Pisidia. That's a 100-mile hike, okay? So he just, well, or they came there. Well, we've got to talk a few minutes about this because there's some important things going on. Now, first of all, I didn't mention this previously, but in the Anatolian Peninsula, there are 14 provinces. The Romans named 14 provinces in the Anatolian Peninsula. Ten of them are mentioned in your New Testament. Now, uh, I want to mention one other thing that you, you might be interested in. Perga sits about seven miles inland, okay? Perga is not sitting on the, on the Mediterranean Sea. It's seven miles inland. Just like you remember, we studied Tarsus being about 12 miles inland. Perga's about seven miles inland. So that's interesting to know, I think, because um, you had to go up, up the river just a little bit to get there. Anatolian Peninsula is 156,000 square miles. Now, that's about two-thirds the size of Texas. Give you a rough idea of how much uh, the big the stomping grounds of Paul are at this time. You know, Texas is big, isn't it? 
kind of reminds me of the governor's conference years ago when the governors all got to speak a few minutes and the uh, Texas governor got up there. Boy, Texas is big. He said, I'm going to tell you, it takes three days to go across our state. We are, we are big. He went on about we are big in oil. We are big, big, big. And they are big. After a while, they spoke then the Alaska governor got up. He said, well, um, this Texas governor, he's, he's my friend of mine, but he said, I want to remind him of something. If we, cut, if we cut Alaska in half and make two states out of it, Texas will be the third largest state. So he got the, he got the last word in on that. But I want to read one other thing that's very interesting that I discovered in my studies. Um, you may remember a map, and I asked you to remember this about six, eight weeks ago. <laughs> and I, I can see if you did forget it, I understand that. But there was a, there's a mountain chain you remember the Taurus Mountains? We looked at that. The Taurus Mountains run across, the Pontic Mountains run up on the Black Sea. The Taurus Mountains run on the southern area of present-day Turkey. And I, and I want to read this to you because it's very interesting, mainly because these two men, the Apostle Paul and Barnabas, have to cross these mountains. They have to go up over these mountains to get up to Pisidia, all right? By studying J.W. Gar McGarvey's commentary, I came across some history done by Mr. Housen, H-O-W-S-O-N, in his book called Life and Epistles. And this is a quote I have from his book. Speaking of Paul now and Barnabas, no population through the midst of which he ever traveled <clears throat> abounded more in those pearls of robbers. You remember the listing in um, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty six 26, when Paul lists all the problem, you know, a day and night in the deep, etc., etc. One of those statements, the second one he makes, is pearls of robbers. This is one of those places. Mr. Housen says this, no population through the midst of which he ever traveled abounded more in those pearls of robbers of which he himself speaks than the wild and lawless clans of the Pisidian Highlanders. That's from page 162 of his book. So when they cross over here, they've got to go through a mountain pass. Most of you know about the Laramie Trail and the Oregon Trail if you study American history. And they went across the Rockies. What did they pick? They picked passes. What's that? That's a low gap in the mountains, right, to get across easier. Well, they had to go through a pass on these mountains as well. And these highwaymen, these robbers are waiting. Uh, it, it, we don't have a record of them attacking these two men, Paul and, Paul and Barnabas, but it's been postulated, it's been questioned, it's been maybe suggested that maybe John Mark left the two of them because he feared what they were facing. And that is a possibility, just a possibility. Now, let's see what happens when he gets up to, uh, his, uh, uh, pity, uh, he gets up to the next stop. He says, but the, in, 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 in verse 14, but when they departed from Perga and came to Antioch of Pisidia, and remember that's a hundred mile hike, it took several days, hard going. He says, and he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. You picture that? Think back. Think back a couple thousand years with me. Will you do that? Here come a uh, Saturday morning, we're at the synagogue, and we got Paul, the apostle, and we got Barnabas, and they go into that synagogue. And can't you see the confidence? They go up to the front, and they sit down. He says he sat down. Well, what gave him that right? It was a tradition in that day and time, in a Hebrew synagogue, that if you were a faithful Jew, you were given the opportunity to speak. 
What I like about it is he went down. He sat down. I've got something to say, and I'm going to wait my turn. And he gets that turn. Let's look at the, let's look at the scriptures and see what they say here. <clears throat> Verse 4, 15. And after the reading of the law of the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. In other words, okay, you have, uh, you, they had an agenda. They had a program like we do here at our worship. They had things they did, had speakers. But when they were all done, then if you had something to say, you were given the opportunity. And that's what, what we're seeing here at the end of verse 15. Say on. It's your turn. You get to speak. The floor is yours. Paul stood up in verse 16 and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel and ye that fear God, give audience. He's beckoning with his hands. Okay, now, you know, maybe they're getting a little weary. Maybe they're getting a little sleepy. They've been through the program and then maybe they're kind of ready to go. He said, now, wait a minute. Listen up. Listen up. Give audience. Pay attention to me. Give audience. And he, continue, he starts off with a, a history lesson. Acts 17, excuse me, chapter 13, verse 17 through 13, verse 40 is a history lesson. It kind of puts me to mind a little bit of Stephen and Acts, and Acts 7 over there, and it cost him his life, but it reminds me a little bit of his history lesson that he gave the Jews. And he ends this, in verse, uh, when, he, when he says, verse 40, Beware, therefore, lest it come upon you which is spoken of in the prophet. You beware, because what the prophets are, were talking about may be very well intended for you. And then he says what in verse 41? Behold, ye despisers. Got that? Is he very, uh, is he very, is he pretty straightforward? Is he, is he uh, very friendly? Yeah, he just told the truth, didn't he? You despisers, and wander and perish. For I work in your days a work which you shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. You're not going to believe this. He, he, he's saying, you're despisers of the truth. You're not going to believe it. Now, in verse 42, when the Jews, was a remarkable, a remarkable thing about the truth here now. In verse 42, and when the Jews were going to the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them when? Can you come back next week? He could twist in his arm a little bit. Can you come back next? Please come back next week. We want to hear more of this. Isn't that what the truth does to good and honest hearts? I want, I want more. We, we want more. And you might ask, well, Wayne, why are what are the Gentiles doing in the synagogue? Yeah, the next verse tells us. 43, now when the synagogue, when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes Okay, Jews, Gentiles weren't forbidden from coming into the synagogue, but they, they went in, and when they heard the truth, it says, followed Paul and Barnabas, verse 43, who speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Next 44, and the next, and the next Sabbath day came almost, the whole city gathered to hear the word of God. Now, let me ask you this question. What do you think this week, we've got a week here, right? They went one Sabbath, they said, the Gentiles said, please come back the next Sabbath. And then when they did come back, the, almost the whole city was there. How do you think that happened? What do you think that the Apostle Paul and Barnabas were doing all week? Huh? Evangelizing, right? Keep in mind, they've got years of evangelistic experience under their belt. Barnabas did it by himself. Paul likely was doing it in Cilicia. Establishing churches, they get together, Acts 11, 25, and 26. They work for over a year there. So these guys are experienced evangelists. They work that week. In How would you get the whole city to come there? Now look. Oh, man, the Jews were happy about this. This is great. We've never been able to have success like that. Is that what, was that their feeling? Look at verse 45. But the Jews saw the multitudes. They were filled with what? filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and what? Blaspheming. I call this plan A. We've got a plan A and a plan B. We may not get to B the next week, but they, what, bad-mouthed it. Blas, blas, 
blasphemers that speak evil of. They talk evil of them and just said some horrible things about them. And it intimidated Paul and Barnabas to the point that they ran out of town and hid in a cave. Is that what the next verse says? What's it say? They wax what? They wax bold. They dug their heels in, said, all right, bring it on. We're going to preach, we're going to preach the truth. No matter what happens to us, we're going to preach God's word, and that's exactly what we're going to do. Very important, a pivotal verse, very pivotal verse for 46. When, then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should what? Let me hear it nice and loud. Should what? Should what? I can't hear you yet. Should what? First, right? First. All right. You remember we talked about Acts 9.15 earlier today. Three entities. But I mentioned to you that very likely you're going to find out by a later study about the order of that. Now what I mean by that, of course, is Acts 9.15 talks about the three entities, but we don't find out about the order. We've got to study all the way through chapter 13, verse 46, to find out the order. The order. Got three entities. What's the order? The Jews first. Okay. Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles. No doubt about it. We find that in these verses here. But he was to go first to who? To God's people, the Israelites, the children of Israel, were to get first refusal, if you will. And that's the way he presented it. Okay, the order established in Acts 13, 46, and also the verse you're familiar with, Romans 1, 16, makes it crystal clear that he was supposed to preach the gospel to the Jews first. Okay. Now, how, how, did, how did he do this? How was he able to do this? We saw a little evidence at the beginning of this verse when they dug their heels in. But first of all, I talk about the three C's. Well, they got four of them. We got his commission. And then we got three C's it took for him to carry out that commission. What did it take to carry out? The same thing it takes for you and I to live, successfully live a Christian life today. These three C's. We've got, we got to have these three C's, just like he had. First one he had was, of course, his conviction. He was convicted. We obey the gospel. We've been pricked in our heart, right? We were convicted. We got it, but, it, but it's a one thing to be convicted to get wet today, but how about to carry that banner the rest of your life? You've got to have some commitment, don't you? That's exactly right. You've got to be committed. All right, you and I got to have that same commitment. Now, Brother um, Glenn Colley says one of, the greatest, one of the greatest attributes or benefits of having a strong faith is it gives you courage. You always want to remember that. A strong faith will give you courage. And that's exactly what we see here. Now, when he went up in that synagogue and got up in that seat and sat down, did he have some courage? And when they waxed bold, did he have some courage? And you and I are going to see time and time again throughout these three journeys and the voyage to Rome, we're going to see all three of these seas in this remarkable gospel preacher. Example for all of us in our daily living as a Christian. Carry that banner to the end, Matthew 10, 22. Now, I'm not going to have time to go into plan B. Plan A was blaspheming. That didn't work. Why? They waxed bold. We're not, we're not going anywhere. We're going to preach the truth. That plan A didn't work. So they go to plan B. And next week, uh, you and I are going to look at, Lord willing, we're going to look at plan B. And uh, the bottom line is, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Remember that when you read the rest of this chapter. Anybody got a question now? We've got about a minute. No questions. You got it all. You're, okay. You telling me I did my job? I don't know about that. <laughs> Donna, sister, Yes. Yeah. Yes. Some encouragement. 
Somebody watching his back, yeah, that's a very important point. Thank you. All right, y'all dismissed. Thank you very much.
I'd like to wish you good morning. Great for your presence this morning, especially if you're visiting. Am I on? Okay. Am I? Thank you for your presence this morning, especially if you're visiting. I do see some visitors. So glad you're here. Stick around. Let's get to know you. And if you're visiting online, we appreciate you there as well. Come on in and see us. Just a few announcements before we begin, begin worship. Chachi's sister-in-law, Rita Gwaltney, just diagnosed with esophageal cancer. So please keep her in your prayers. That's Rita Gwaltney. And a cousin of the Durham's, Woody Clark, he has uh, gone into comfort care. The family asked for prayers on his behalf. That's Woody Clark. Angelo, uh, his dad, uh, John Duran, he's in the ICU currently um, with, with health issues. And uh, they request prayers. And the Garveys will be traveling up here soon to see him. Uh, keep all them in your prayers. Uh, Peyton, he's leaving for Europe on Tuesday to begin his study abroad. And Emily, she was just, she's desperate for prayers on her baby boy's behalf. So please uh, keep him in mind as well. And lastly, this card from the Pettits. Hey guys, can't thank you all enough. We appreciate all of your hard work. You made our move much easier by doing all of the loading in such a short period of time. We got here right on schedule. And it took two guys three and a half hours to unload. We are still unpacking the boxes. We will miss you all. Stay faithful. As we enter worship, let's go to God in prayer. Our God, we're so grateful for the opportunity to do just that, to be faithful to you, to serve you, to obey the commands that you've given us. Thank you for the things you've given us to make worship a little easier. But we know that's a, a difficult the thing to keep our minds on, on track and on task. And please help us to do that this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. morning. Singing all four verses of In Christ Alone, I encourage you to sing out and keep the tempo up. In Christ Alone, my hope is found.
couple of weeks ago, uh, we had the blessing of being able to take part in a youth rally that was held here. And the activity that we were asked to help with was called Load the Truck. And the bed of a pickup truck represented our lives. And there were boxes labeled with different aspects of life. Uh, family, school, jobs, friends, relationships, faith, and sin. And during that activity, the, the kids were asked to, to load the truck with those different boxes. And we talked about priorities. And I asked them, what is God's priority? And they said, we are. And I asked them, how do you know? And they said, because he died for us. And I mentioned back a couple weeks ago how Rick McCurdy spoke on a Wednesday night to us. And he said, you know, as atheists stand and look at the night sky at all the, and stare at all the stars, how they say how insignificant I am, right? But as Christians, we stare at the night sky and see all the stars. And we say, how special am I? that my God created this beautiful earth for us to, to live on, right? But as we gather here this morning to partake of the Lord's Supper together, how loved should we feel? John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, Jesus, the creator of the universe, left the perfect place, heaven, to come to this imperfect place, the world, to live, to be tempted, to be scorned, mocked, tortured, and hung on a cross, to die for our sins. We are God's priority. You are God's priority. Will you pray with me, please? Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity we have to, to gather together and to partake of these emblems that represent your love for us, that represents the sacrifice of, of Jesus on that cruel cross, so that we may one day have the hope of eternal life with you in heaven. Dear Heavenly Father, as, as we partake of this bread, we ask your blessings upon it, upon it us as we partake of it and help us to focus our hearts and our minds on that cruel cross where Jesus died for us. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Will you pray with me again, please? Again, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to, to gather together to remember the death of your Son on that cruel cross, the shedding of his blood that is represented by this cup. Dear Heavenly Father, as we partake of this cup, we ask your blessings upon it and upon us as we partake of it. Help us again to to remember your love and the sacrifice of Christ that gives us the hope of eternal life with you in heaven. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.
You know, with, with priorities, you can often tell well, where a person's priority is, where they spend their time, how they spend their money. Now is the time that we have to show that God is our priority, whether it's the spending of our time or the giving of our money so that his work may be done in the community. Will you pray with me, please? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the, the blessings that you bestow on each and every one of us. We truly are a blessed people, and we thank you so much. At this time, as we return a portion of those gifts back to you, we ask your blessings on those gifts, that they will be used in a, a, the proper manner to spread your word throughout this community so that others may learn and know you and the love that you have for them. Again, we, we thank you so much for all that you give us. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Wonderful, merciful Savior. We sing this hymn, and then followed by this hymn, we'll be led in prayer. Wonderful, merciful Savior, refreshing me. Shall we bow? Heavenly Father, we thank thee so much for allowing us to be here this morning. Thank you for allowing us to hear these songs that are so uplifting, and we thank thee for the song leader and his abilities. We pray that you'll continue to bless him as he continues to lead us in this service. We thank thee for Brother Jerry and the lesson he has prepared for us. We pray that each one of us will open our minds and hearts and allow these things to come within our lives so that we can be pleasing to you to 
allow the, us to be the examples we need to be in today's world. There's so many things going on around us that we need to be aware of. We know that our brothers and sisters in Ukraine are just going through so much and so many trials and tribulations as a whole country. We pray that if it be your will that you will allow this conflict to come to an end and peace can be restored. Be with all the ones that have experienced the loss of lives and loss of property in Kentucky and all the things that they've been going through. We pray that you'll help them and help those that want to minister to them to be able to get to the, all the aid that they do need. Pray to continue to be with our elders here this morning and, and always as they always hold us dear and close to their hearts and always strive to keep us on the path that we need to be to be a child of thee and allow us to grow in a spirit and knowledge of thy word. We thank thee so much for the teachers we have that give of their time and their means to present lessons and study thy word and then proclaim it to us so that we can grow in our knowledge. We thank thee for being with the young people if you've allowed most of them to return to school this past week and we pray that you'll give them a good year and we know that we have so many educators in our midst and we pray that you'll bless them as they go through so many things that they prepare and strive to teach these young minds and help them to become adults and to become a valued member of society and we pray that you'll be with this nation as we it seemed like we have veered from the path of looking to thee first. We pray that you'll allow us to come back to you and allow us to have thee first in all things that we do. Pray now that as we have this hour that we can be uplifted by one another as we have this fellowship with one another, that it just strengthens us and helps us. We know that we have many sick that are not able to be with us, but they want to be with us so badly. We pray that you will grant them a measure of health so that they can. We pray now that we do all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus is 
Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2. I've said this before, but let me say it again. If you grew up in a home where you were taken to Sunday school, how fortunate you were. And I hope those of us who were taken appreciate those who took us, and the teachers who taught us. And perhaps as you're sitting there right now, if you went to Sunday school, if you went to Wednesday Bible class, you're thinking about those teachers in your mind, maybe one or two that were special. I'm thinking of a lady right now when I was younger who was one of my teachers, and I'm thinking of a man right now who was one of my teachers as I got older, and perhaps you're doing the same thing. Likely at some point in your Bible classes, you studied about an Old Testament man named Moses. We have a toddler class for the little ones, and one of the teachers, Miss Marcia, taught Harper Rose about Moses before she turned two, if I'm not mistaken. Baby Moses opened his eyes on a world very different from our world. And although his parents didn't know it at that time, the birth of Moses and the series of events that would come later would change the course of nations. The very title of the book of Moses begins, as it begins, points to a great event that's going to take place in that book of Exodus, the departure or going out, Exodus. And there's going to be a mass exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. They had lived there some 400 years, and within the protection of Egypt, that family of about 70 had grown into a number estimated between two or three million. Exodus tells us of the birth of the nation of Israel. It records great events and high drama. Several months ago, I began a series of lessons in Exodus on Moses, and I want to continue that series this morning. As a review, one of our young men, Andrew, is going to come up and read some passages from Exodus chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Andrew is one of our good guys. He's a student at Glenver High School. Andrew, come up and read to us. Now, a man from the house of Levi went and took his wife, a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when he saw that he was a fine child, she hid him, in th uh, hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took and dabbled it with vitamin and bitch, er, pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the riverbank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done with him. Now the daughter of the Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young woman walked, walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant, woman, her servant woman, and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to the Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew woman to nurse the child for you? And the Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother, and the Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. 
When the child grew older, she brought him to the Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses because, she said, I drew him out of the water. Thank you, Andrew. Chapter 10 draws the curtain on Moses as Pharaoh's son. And then chapter 11 opens the curtain back up on Moses as an adult. And that's where we'll pick up today. I want to welcome everyone. We are glad to have you. If you're here as a visitor and I see some visitors, thank you for coming. It's an encouragement to us when you're here. If you're online and a visitor, great to have you. Now, I'm pleased to let you know that in just a few minutes, we're going to sing a song. And for our purposes, we'll call it a song of invitation. And that invitation is for you to become a Christian. Wayne and Tom are teaching a class on Sunday morning on the book of Acts. Sometimes we refer to the book of Acts as the book of conversions. Acts has many examples of people being converted to Christ. Now, definition of conversion, a change in, what, in which one adopts a new religion or faith or belief. Synonyms for conversion would be transformation, changes, alteration. Sometimes we speak of conversion in a common way, like converting uh, cotton to cloth, converting water to ice. In all of these processes, a change takes place. Repent, therefore, and be converted. What will happen, Peter? That your sins may be blotted out. Acts 3, verse number 19. Conversion in the Bible means to change by turning to God. There must be a change of heart produced by faith. Peter, speaking of the Gentiles, said, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts, watch it, by faith. Acts 15, 9. There must be a change of life produced by repentance. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. 2 Corinthians 7, verse number 10. There must be a change of state produced by baptism. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, Galatians 3.27. And when you do that, you get newness of life, Romans 6.4. We're going to sing a song in a short time, I won't be long, to encourage you to be converted, to encourage you to examine your spiritual needs so that we might assist you in any way. Don't be like Felix, who spoke of a convenient season, Acts 24. Don't be like Agrippa, almost you persuade me, Acts 26. Be like the eunuch of Acts 8. What hinders me from being baptized? All right, one thing. Before we start in verse 11 of Exodus 2, a number of us that are sitting in here today got to do something that we love, that we had not done in three years, attend Virginia Christian camp. This week, Mrs. Anderson and I will get to do something we love that we have not done in three years. We will get to attend Polishing the Pulpit in Sevierville, Tennessee. Now, before we get to Sevierville, we plan on taking a short trip to Bryson City, North Carolina, 
That's near Cherokee, if you've ever been there, there right at the Smokies. While there, my favorite quilt lady will get to engage in one of her favorite activities, going to Starvation Plantation Quilt Shop. Yes, that is a real place. She loves, L-O-V-E-S, capitalized, she loves going to that fabric shop. And we'll also uh, plan to go to Nantahala Outdoor Center before we cross the Smokies into Gatlinburg and then on to Sevierville where they hold PTP. In 2020, I was scheduled to teach a session at PTP on who are your heroes. And since PTP was postponed, well, last two years, they asked me to carry that over into 2022. And I've already asked Miss Kay and want to ask any of you who are at PTP on Monday, Monday a week, and you might see my name on the schedule, who might think I should go to Jerry's session and support a West Sider. I appreciate that, but please don't come to my session. You can hear me here. Go somewhere else and listen to someone else. And I'm going to say this. If Sheila Butt has a class at 830 on Monday morning, I already know where Miss Kay is going to be. She loves Sheila Butt. And when she tells me about her, she must be a fine teacher. And as a plug for our Ladies' Day in October, guess who the speaker is? Yes, one and the same, Sheila Butt. And let me mention, earlier this month, on August 4th, Sheila Butt was elected the mayor of Maury County, Tennessee. In Acts 7, 22, we read that Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians. Now, hold on to that thought. Educated by the Egyptians, all the learning. It also says he was a man of power in words and deeds. Now, I read where a boy reared in Egypt like Moses was would attend the temple of the sun. And from history and archaeologists, we learn that would have been a premier educational center. The temple of the sun has been called the Oxford of the ancient world. So Moses would begin to learn the language of the Egyptians, hieroglyphics 101, if you will, with its stylized symbols that represent complex ideas. History tells us he would have plunged into sciences, medicine, astronomy, chemistry, theology, law, he likely took the Egyptian equivalent of ROTC, studying battles and combat tactics. On top of that, he would have learned arts and literature. The adopted son of the princess would have been immersed in Egyptian learning. Now, of course, I'm stating these facts based on history, not scripture. But another thought is that Moses was a quick study. That it didn't take this former Hebrew slave long to grasp these heavy courses. He was a man, as Acts 7 says, powerful in words and deeds. He would have earned respect. By the time he reached 30, extra-biblical historians tell us that he had already led the Egyptian armor to a smashing victory 
over the Ethiopians. A bold military strategist, highly valued, bronzed by the sun, hardened by battle, wise in worldly affairs, a competent leader. Are any of you thinking, wow, if all of that is true, what an upbringing to lead a huge group of people through the desert later on in life. Verse 11. And when he went out, now, I'm sorry, verse 11. Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. He went out to his brethren. What an amazing statement in light of what I've just talked about. At what point did Moses start to understand his destiny as a Hebrew? Did God put into his mind that he would one day, through some as yet unrevealed manner, lead these people out of bondage? Well, we're not sure. But I assume he has made his decision to forsake his palace life. Or at least he's thinking about it. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. If you're taking notes, that's Hebrews 11, verse number 24 through 26. Verse 12. All right, so Moses sees this Egyptian beating a Hebrew. Verse 12. So he looked this way and that way, and when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Killing was wrong. Moses would have to learn that deliverance would not be accomplished by his hand, but by the hand of God, not his hand of force, but by God's will. It would not be based on Moses' way and Moses' schedule. So here's Moses. He looks this way, and he looks that way. Coast is clear. Whack. Or maybe it was stab. Didn't really say how he killed him. Did Moses bother to look up? It appears he took care of the horizontal, but how about the vertical? How about God's timing? Well, that taskmaster, he deserved to be stopped, someone might say. The problem was that when Moses began his own operation deliverance, where was God in the plan? The vertical part? Where was that part of the plan? He hid the Egyptian in the sand. So, the result of this murderous action by Moses was a body in the sand. Invariably, when we act out of impulse based on what we feel right then, Without putting God first in our actions, we end up with a body in the sand. We have to bury the motive. 
We have to bury the results. We have to conceal a lie or a half-truth. We have to backtrack on a boast. We have to fudge the numbers a little. We have to cover our tracks. We have to stay in the shadows so we won't be seen. It is just a matter of time before the truth catches up with us. The sand invariably yields its secrets. When we neglect to seek God's counsel, when we neglect to seek God's timing, then we step in and do it our way. By and by, we have a mess on our hands. We're stuck with a corpse, a shovel in our hands, and a shallow grave at our feet. They found out what he did, didn't they? The word got out. The sand couldn't keep the corpse buried enough so no one would know. The cover-up didn't cover it up. How about years later, when God took charge and Moses acted according to God's timing? You know what happened then? God was able to cover up the whole Egyptian army under the Red Sea, horses, chariots, weapons, and all. Verse 13. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men, two Hebrew men were fighting. And he said to the one who, and he said to the one who did the wrong, Why are you striking your companion? Then he said, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me? As you kill the Egyptian? So Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. Indeed it was. How interesting that Moses goes back out there. It says the next day he tries to break up a fight between two Hebrews. Who made you a ruler and judge over us? Hey, fancy palace boy, just back off. You're not our leader. What a crushing put down for someone who had put it on the line. They were not ready for Moses. Someone has said regarding spiritual leadership, I suppose if you really want to know Who is a spiritual leader? You ought to look around and see how many who are spiritual are following him. The Hebrews were not ready to be led by this man at this time. For Moses, this may have been a time of surprise, a time of confusion, And then definitely followed by a time of fear. When Moses' sand-buried secret hit the prime time networks, he got the shakes. He fled from the presence of Pharaoh. But what Moses had done was pretty much open rebellion toward the Egyptians. Pharaoh couldn't stomach having a disloyal, out-of-control prince on his hands. Moses had crossed the line. Moses, who had been educated in all the learning of the Egyptians, but that A-plus in advanced hieroglyphics, it did not give him discerning wisdom, perspective wisdom, at least in this matter, 
It appears at this point that Moses was not ready to lead. And the enslaved Hebrew people were not ready for his leadership. It would require 40 years of God's discipline and God's preparation before the bush would burn and Moses would be given his commission. Verse 15. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. This land of Midian, uh, the area was located in the southeast portion of the Arabian Peninsula, according to Kaufman's commentary. Various classical historical sources place Midian in what is now the northwest part of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Now, as a point of interest here, These people of Midian apparently were some kin to the Hebrews through Abraham's later wife. You know, after Sarah had died and he remarried, you remember that wife's name? Starts with a K. Keturah. Abraham again took a wife and her name was Keturah and she bore him. Now listen. Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, Shua. I'm assuming that son Midian is the Midian of the Midianites later on. Midian has been described by one writer as incredibly barren, hot, arid sand and gravel, punctuated by craggy chunks of rock with an occasional scraggly bush somehow clinging to life. If that is the case, can we imagine Moses stumbling through this wasteland as he flees Egypt? Did he have time to take off his tailored uh, prince clothes? Moses was not strutting down the road singing a happy tune. He was a frightened, disillusioned fugitive running for his life. His vaunted uh, palace education meant little to him now. Do you wonder if Moses thought... As he's walking along, I mean, he doesn't even know what he's going to do. He's just escaping at this point. Do you wonder if he thought, life is over. I messed up. God can never use me. I'm finished. Moses was in no way finished. We know that because we can read the rest of the story. But it would be many weary years before he fully realized that. He didn't know the rest of the story. For Here's the thing. As we think about Moses, how about us? Have we ever felt? I've tried so hard. I've tried so many things. I've pushed myself so relentlessly. Nothing has worked. Folks, don't ever think that means you are finished. With God there, you are in no way finished. Notice what Moses did at the end of verse 15. He sat down by a well. Perhaps for us, folks, we need to realize at times we just need to sit still. 
relax, recalibrate, just be content to sit by the well a little while. And while you're there, take a drink of water. And no, I'm not talking about the well water to rehydrate your body fluids. Take a drink of the living water to rehydrate your soul. Christ told the Samaritan lady in her well encounter, But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Would you like a drink of that water? You can have it right now as we stand and sing. Another great lesson from Jerry. Appreciate that. And again, if you're visiting, we're grateful for your presence. Um, I forgot to mention earlier in the announcements because I was blinded by the light of her stone that Olivia is engaged, and uh, the proposal came over the weekend. So uh, congratulate her, even though she's moving to that place that Jerry described with chunks of craggy rock and desolation and sand, that being Oklahoma. But uh, we, we can forgive her for that. Let's close in prayer. Let us all bow. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to meet safely in the confines of the building today. And we thank you for the blessed sunshine that you've uh, given us these last few days. Father, we go through so many dreary times in life and so much rain falls in our life. And when we see the sunshine, we know uh, that it's a source of rejuvenation, a reju uh, source of spirit renewal for us. Father, as we go into uh, this week, Allow us to hold our heads high, be good Christians, set the good examples to the people around us, the people at work, the people that we um, live with, and certainly our neighbors. There are many of us that are traveling to PTP. Allow 
um, allow safe travels to all the people that are attending there, allow good health to, um, you know, be, um, good health to be uh, sustained throughout the entire week. And Father, we know that, um, you know, so much will come out of this and uh, so many lessons to be heard. And it's been a long time coming, three years now since the last PTP. Father, be with Brother Peyton Ritchie as he leaves Tuesday for his uh, studies abroad. We know that this will be a challenging time for the Ritchie family and, uh, and for the Martins and, and all the other people you know, involved uh, in his own personal life. And, and Father, we grant him God's speed to you know, get there safely, be productive as a student, and certainly absorb all he can from uh, the studying abroad. Father, as we think about our country, allow us to uh, you know, pray for our leaders. It's so good to see uh, people like Sheila Butt you know, become leaders once again, as she was a legislature once before in Tennessee, and, and now she's a mayor. Um, there is hope, Father. There is so many uh, good things that are happening right now, and, and you know, we, we have a tendency to see the negative, and we have a tendency to uh, focus on the bad things in life, and, and that's what draws attention in the news, but there's so much other good things out there, including uh, your, uh, God's word, your word, that we can spread on a daily basis. Be with us as we continue on throughout the day. Hold our heads high and once again, be good examples to the people around us. In your most holy and precious name we ask this, through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen.